Last week, I spoke a bit about the Aboriginal Shakedown Bill, which is the West Australian Bill uh, for the Australian Heritage Act, which allows Aboriginals to declare a piece of land as being as being their land. It's sacred land. It has intangible elements to it that mean that they have rights to it, which is going to be a big problem for anybody trying to deal with agriculture or farming or even just building anything on particular land because literally a council of aboriginals in Australia can show up, tell you that they have right to that land for some undefined reason. In the actual legislature itself, it says that if you ask the question, are you telling the truth? What makes this land special, et cetera, et cetera. That's a culturally insensitive question. Uh, so they don't have to prove anything. So if you find yourself asking that question, being told no, and then maybe being found guilty that you built on land that was supposedly sacred for intangible reasons, uh, then you can be liable to a lot of money. And that will come into effect on the 1st of July. But they do already actually have legislation already legislating that kind of thing. This one just goes even further. So watch that video from last week if you want a bit more information. And uh, I was informed by some of our Australian viewers that while that was a big story, I had missed some of the extra stories, some of the larger picture, which I was already a, a little bit aware of, but didn't think it was um, fit for just the one segment to cover both sides. So here, thank you for anybody who got in touch to sell me what was going on with the greater picture in Australia, and I'll be covering that now. But before I go any further, uh, on the website, as always, we've got some wonderful material. We've got lots of work that we do on here, including Josh's contemplation series, talking about order and chaos with Stelios in the latest episode. And I will tell you this. I know that you're still a little bit hesitant on this studio. Callum is a true conservative, any change whatsoever, and he just hates it. You could ask him to change his shirt and he will cry. I've seen it happen. Um, but one thing that is really good about this new studio is we can have more than two people in at any one time. And on the Friday, uh, I took part in a contemplations with Josh, which was always a pleasure, uh, but also Stelios at the same time, because we're able to have three people in the studio at any one time now, up to five, in fact, although we've not tried that just yet. And it was a really good conversation. So if you've not thought about subscribing to the website before, maybe consider now because the breadth of content that we're able to produce has expanded massively. So please feel free to sign up. It's only five pounds a month and you'll have access to everything that we've done before and everything that we're going to be doing in the future as well, which is very exciting as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, something that somebody sent me was um, building off of the details from last week. This is the result of the Aboriginal Heritage Act that's already in place. So let's just get a practical example of the kind of nonsense that the act that's already in place gives that will now be expanded as of the 1st of July, shall we? So this was an article from, uh, let me see, ABC News talking about Australian place names don't sound real to me. Uh, they have a rather suspiciously named mountain, shall I say. Uh, but <laughs> you might know Wait, the which one. There's a few in Australia. Uh, you, you you can make up your own mind. Look the ones up... that look like a human head. The, well, there's that one, but then there's also one that shall we say um, uh, Mount N word is an actual <laughs> place in Australia. This real. Of you course can, it is. Yeah, of course you can look it up. I don't know why it's real, but it is real. I'm just reporting the facts there. Uh, but this place Tudye, uh, that doesn't sound like a real word, but I'll go with it. Real estate agent Tony Maddox pleads not guilty to Aboriginal Heritage Act breach. So this is the one that was already in place. So he's facing up to nine months in jail for breaching the West Australia Aboriginal Heritage Act. Uh, he pleaded not guilty. He was charged by the state's Heritage Act uh, Department last month after building a creek crossing his property. That sounds like something that you should be able to do, right? This is my property. It's got a little bit of water running over it. I'll build something to be able to you know, cross over that bit of water. Can you guess why it is that that was illegal? Engines. Engines. Yeah. Yeah. Engines. Aboriginal engines. The prosecution claimed the works, which included the removal of a large amount of silt from the Boyer Gering Brook running through his property, disrupted the Wagul, a rainbow serpent central to Noongar mythology. So the imaginary serpent was disturbed. The prosecution statement- This isn't a parody article. This is no, real. this is real. This is real, and a man might go to prison for nine months as a result for of upsetting it. Wagu. For, resetling, for, for, for upsetting the Gabagul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they make that up. That, that can't be a real engine. It's an insensitive question. 
You could just make it up. And if you say, that doesn't sound real to me. Sorry, yeah, that's an insensitive that. question. You've got no right to ask it. The prosecution statement of facts, and facts is a term being used very loosely well, in this context. Well, obviously, is real and you have upset him. I well, yeah, know. states that any alteration to the Wagul's home could scare it <laughs> from the water, causing it to dry up and causing harm to the surrounding environment and people. So if you scare away our imaginary serpent, the riverbed will dry up. This seems, given that he's already built it and moved everything, if it has scared off the imaginary rainbow serpent, then, you know, I guess we just give it time. And if the river dries up, then the Aboriginals proved right. This is something easily testable. And uh, under the act, just to give more context again, a person may not excavate, destroy, damage, conceal, or in any way alter any Aboriginal site. Once again, the Aboriginals can just show up at any time and say, this is one of our sites. We had a magical experience here. It's got intangible elements. So that means it's ours. You're not allowed to do anything with it unless you pay us exorbitant amounts of money. If convicted, Miss, Mr. Maddox could be fined more than 20,000 Australian dollars. So that's about £2.50 in real money and be sentenced to spend time behind bars. So... That's how it goes at the moment. This new West Australia Aboriginal Act will be even more ridiculous and will go into power as of the 1st of July. So West Australians, I'm terribly sorry. May God have mercy on the souls. But there was a bigger part to this story as well, which was the referendum that will be going on at the end of next year, which starts here, which is uh, the Uluru Statement from the heart. This is the thing that kick-started what's going on in Australia right now. So it's a 2017 petition by Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders to change the constitution of Australia to improve, improve the representation of Indigenous Australians. The statement was released on 26th of May 2017 by delegates of the First Nations National Constitutional Convention held over four days near Uluru in central Australia. The convention was held after the 16-member referendum council appointed by Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and leader of the opposition Bill Shorten on the 7th of December 2015 had travelled around the country and met with over 1,200 people. The statement was issued after the convention and calls for a First Nations voice in the Australian Constitution and the Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making. <laughs> Terribly sorry. Is that part of the language? I think <laughs> it might be, to be fair. I would need to be taking sips of booze in between. But okay. anyway, and uh, truth telling between the Australian government and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the final report on the Referendum Council contains the following recommendations that a referendum be held to provide in the Australian constitution for a representative body that gives Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations a voice to the Commonwealth Parliament. One of the specific functions of such a body to be set out in the legislation outside of the constitution should include the function of monitoring the use of the heads of power in section 51 and section 122. The body will recognise the status of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. So what this is essentially asking for is an advisory board as part of the government, as part of the parliament, to give them certain parliamentary power that will be able to advise on anything that the Australian government does. Now, I have been told there are some problems with this, given that Australia itself, of these Aboriginal peoples, like with Injuns in America, all have various different tribes, which all have various different factions within them. You're joking which all have various different aims and goals towards one another. They're, so, they're not just a bunch of people with feathers then, in their heads? They're not all just crying. the same people with Damn. feathers in their heads. So, And they don't all believe the same things either. So what one tri tribe may say will be contradicted by another tribe. Someone and believes then, in Wagul, but someone else doesn't believe in Wagul. Exactly. Yeah. And then what? where do you stand on the Wagul question? But I'm that, pro Wagul, that, really. Oh, um, so do I, actually. So I'm <laughs> glad to see that we're united on this front. Charge but, that man but it turns 50. out the First Nations tribes are not united on the Wagul question, which, if they suddenly have a certain amount of power with the parliament as part of an advisory board, could create some issues. So if I go further, so what is the key voice to parliament? The five key questions. So this statement, this Uluru statement, has now snowballed into this referendum that's going on in Australia. So there are five key questions that Australia is asking according to this uh, this article, but I'll just go through some of the information, the primary information that they give in here. So the legislation for the crucial vote passed on the Senate on Monday, meaning the referendum must now take place within the next six months. So it'll probably be happening sometime before the end of the year. 
excuse me. The Indigenous Voice to Parliament aims to provide a permanent representation and voice for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at each level of government. It would put a body that represents the interests of Australia's First Nations people. Simply put, the voice would be an advisory board for all levels of government, every single level of government, on how parliamentary decisions affect First Nations people. The for final format has yet to be decided. So what these people are voting on, similar to Brexit, they've no idea how this will look in practice. There's no practical understanding of how this will look. So they're just voting on, do you want to give the people a voice? The way it's being put forward as the question is, do you want to give these people a voice in the parliament, in government? So many people might not understand what that is, but either way- like At least with Brexit, you can say, do you want to leave the EU? <laughs> yes, but yes. this just means, do you want to give them a voice? I mean, so, what, that could be anything between, okay, they get a representative who can't even vote in the parliament to, we give them veto power over all laws. So far, they're saying there's no veto power that will be given to them. But given the way these things snowball, given the way the West Australia Aboriginal Heritage Act colonists, works, after all, what right do you have? Yeah, exactly. This is their country. Why shouldn't they be able to just veto anything that the Australian government wants to do? That's how this will snowball. I mean, it's a nonsense argument, but we don't live in an age in which people in the West have an ability to actually argue back against that in the mainstream. No, Instead, because they just capitulate every time. The, the, the West or Western peoples have just completely subsumed themselves to this ideology that if this person came first, then that means that they have ultimate as right to say whatever. Yeah, because they're not us. Yeah. Re realistically speaking, despite the fact, and some people might find it insensitive, there was this thing called right of conquest, which means that uh, we met in a field and we, we fought each other. And you guys lost. So we get dibs. I mean, that seems like the fairest way, personally, but never mind. Yeah, yeah. Certainly. <laughs> I mean, what else? I think maybe the Prime Minister of Australia should maybe just get, all the tribes can get together, find one representative, Case have match. an arm wrestle. No, arm wrestle. Arm wrestle. There you go. See. Okay. And then whoever wins gets Australia. And it's, it's smarter than this, because this is just the extended arm wrestle <laughs> over a period of years and years and years until one wins Australia anyway. If you are not yourself sovereign, or if you do not know who the sovereign is, then somebody else will assume sovereignty of your nation. That's just how it works. You can't just have these things mixed. You can't have these things sort of balancing each other out in power in practice, because eventually someone will end up having the final say of this. And if you want to just cede all power over because you have a guilty liberal bleeding heart, then congratulations, you're going to get kicked out of your own country or have things made so bad for you that you'll want to leave the country anyway. This is just obviously how it's going to work. And, uh, and there's no point pleading with, uh, with countries like ours that, um, that, oh, we're the indigenous peoples. Yeah, we're the indigenous peoples of England and such. I've seen some people make the argument. Bro, we're giving up our country too. Why can't <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, come along? <laughs> uh, I've seen some people make the argument that, oh, what we need to do in the West, in Britain and places like that, is to make the argument to the left that, oh, we're the indigenous peoples, therefore you should ha apply those same standards. No, they don't apply the same standards to us. They don't care. The point is that they don't care about indigenous peoples. They hate indigenous Western European peoples. They hate white peoples is what the actual point is. They just hate us. So it's not going to work. Anyway, that's just a little tangent I threw out there. Uh, moving on, so I'll carry on through this. So the local and regional voices would consist of 35 local voices representing districts around the country, each one individually selected to be the voice for the communities they represent. The elected local voices would engage with politicians at local, state, or federal levels and provide their input. The national voice would have a 24, 24 members, which, would make, which must have a gender balance amongst the board. Why? Because it's arbitrary. Because we've just decided that, you know, gender balance okay. is something that we love. That's what we like. century things. Insert gender balance. Why? I don't know. It's the religion. I mean, reasonably speaking, I mean, maybe the, maybe these tribes, maybe they're the ones that have the magical third gender that they're always talking about. So I guess that would be eight of each. Yeah. How do, you, how do you figure out how many genders they... That is actually a serious thing they're going to no, have to sit down and argue about, isn't that it? That is actually going to be something because I'm sure that these are the sorts of places... You know, the left always like to bring ah. up, oh, well, indigenous peoples have different ideas of gender. Well, yeah, it helps when you've uh, got a certain power, part of your tribe that's all been castrated. Um, so you decide that they're because they've been castrated, that means that they're a different gender. That's generally how these things go. So the thing is, we started off there being like, haha, the left will believe this nonsense. And then we thought, no, no, hang on, that's the main ideology of uh -huh, every no, Western wait, oh government. Oh God, they actually will believe this so nonsense. So if the Western government, they will actually sit down and think about that. They're, they're going to have a committee on how many genders there are in the various tribes to decide whether this or is not how these things work. You, you start off with a simple question. 
of okay, should they have a voice? And then you end up with a panel of government experts and specialists. <laughs> yeah, so well, what about two spirit then? But what about exogender? They're going to start oh. asking stupid questions like that. And uh, they, it says it goes on to state in here. The voice is solely an advisory board to the Australian Parliament and government, and therefore it would only be there to provide evidence on matters which specifically affect Indigenous people. But once again, given that they are automatically being labelled as the first people of the nation, therefore, according to this sort of logic, the entire country belongs to them, any decision made in the country of Australia would automatically affect Indigenous people, especially if they can just rock up to anywhere and say, this is our special land because we may believe in the magic rainbow serpent that lives here and stops the rivers from drying up. That's just how it goes. Therefore, it would not have the power to overrule parliament or legislation, also known as veto powers. I've already made it clear how I think that this is nonsense. Australian people, though, such as my friend Chris Gard, have uh, actually taken a read through some of the advisory reports on the constitutional alteration. And I think Chris Gard who uh, I'm informed on good word, is uh, reliably informed, is at least three quarters Aboriginal himself, um, says, have just re finished reading the bill and can say with confidence that we are, and this is quite poetic language he's using here, uh, governed by malignant retards. This, in conjunction with the West Australian ABO Heritage Act, means we are effed. Agriculture will become nearly impossible, as will mining. Rest in peace, Australia. Um, now, if you want more information from you, this... Where do I find more poetry like that? Um, you just follow Australian <laughs> Twitter. Uh, I've been told that Chris, along with a few other people uh, from Australia, will be talking about this legislation on Friday. So uh, maybe tune in for that if you want some more informed and uh, poetic discussion, such as that that we see here. And uh, the government is doing what you'd expect because it turns out the polling is saying that it's not looking good. It's not looking good for the yes vote right now because a lot of Australians, like Chris, have read the legislation and gone, I don't like this. This sounds like it will destroy this country. So I'm going to call my member of parliament. Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> going to call him a dingo, are we? Hey, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, Bruce. <laughs> Why do uh, I? Sorry, but it's a funny. Why do I? Why do I have a, a, a mental image of a kangaroo in a suit just rocking up to the door? I, I'm just thinking Simpsons, just straight up Simpsons. Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> what they're going to get if it goes no? The prime minister who recommended this is going to get a kick bomb. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Uh, anyway, the the prime minister, despite the fact that polling is not looking good for the yes vote, is saying that he is confident because the latest news poll conducted for the Australian shows more people are now against the voice to parliament than for it big surprise. Those against enshrining the voice in the constitution increased to 40%, up from 43% on June 4th. Support for it has meanwhile decreased from 46% to 43%, with a further 10% undecided. Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia and Tasmania would reject the voice if a referendum were held next weekend. Asked whether there is an alarm within his government ahead of the referendum, Mr Albanese, the Prime Minister, said that there is all upside and no downside for supporting the proposal. No, this is a proposition that has come from the bottom up. Listen, just because you can point to some random indigenous peoples, aboriginal peoples um, uh, statement from 2017 doesn't mean that they had any power whatsoever to instigate this referendum. They asked you for it, and then you did this. The people of Australia as a whole were not clamoring for this legislation, so you can't say that it was bottom, bottom up at all. Uh, from the grassroots arising from the First Nations Constitutional Convention in 2017 at Uluru. That asked for the recognition, but also asked for the recognition to be voiced by giving Australian governments the opportunity to listen to First Nations people on matters that affect them. I think that as Australia focuses on what has been for the Australian people in the last quarter of the year, recognition and listening all upside, no downside for this proposal. This just sounds like a bunch of nonsense. I don't know if they've transcribed this particular interview poorly or not, but that sounds like a bunch of rambling nonsense to me. And uh, there was his statements he's been putting out on Twitter, basically just saying, it's a good thing, bro, just trust me. We may not have any details whatsoever, and this may be one of the biggest complaints from the opposition, that there's no details on how this will work, but trust me, it'll just be all upside. Just trust me, bro. So I said to you when we were chatting about this earlier, this reminds me heavily of the story we covered before of Chile, in which they had a new constitution. Oh, yeah. And it was full of leftist garbage. And one of them mm. was, what if we set up I their own this. government for the, uh, the Indians? And and that's a stupid idea. Yeah, obviously being Chile, they've got voted, I think 75% of the people voted against it. So they're just like, this is trash. So yes, I can only hope that Australia will decide to do the same thing. Hopefully they will, because this is 
absolute trash. It'd be nice also if the Australian government or the West Australian government gave the local people there the ability to vote on, you know, that Aboriginal Heritage Act that seems to potentially destroy their agriculture. But can't all be can't all be winners, can we? It would be rather funny if after this they started blasting Augusta Pinochet's music. But... <laughs> Helicopters start circling. The... No, Some no. of the Aussie listeners, so I just <laughs> yeah. And uh, when we were talking about what might actually take part, uh, like uh, practically result from this as well, uh, people have been pointing out that this man in the background, a Thomas Mayo. Uh, who goes under at Thomas Mayo 23, appears to be part of the Prime Minister's push to get the yes vote out there. So he's written a book called, um, I'm sorry, this camera is in the way. The Voice to Parliament. The Voice to Parliament. Uh, what, what kind of suggestions does he have for what Aboriginal peoples should have? Can you guess? He, he appears to be Aboriginal himself. Can you guess what sort of things that he wants for the Aboriginals in Australia? More money in Medicare? No. Well, so here's him talking in 2020. Uh, we imagine more. This is talking about the Uluru Statement. Just more. We imagine how, using the lessons from the past, the Uluru Statements calls for the constitutional rights to a black representative body with the resources and structural, uh, structure needed to unite on the priorities we collectively determine a vital step in the fight for justice. All sounds very high and mighty so far, but what does that look like? Reparations, of course. Land back. Abolishing harmful colonial institutions Such as the Australian government Yeah, was, that's, <laughs> that's what it will be, won't it? Getting all our kids out of prisons and into care What, even the murderers? Even the murderers? Probably even the murderers Respect and integration of our laws and laws Speaking language, wages back What does wages back the mean? Right to it, sniff petrol it, it, <laughs> We want all the petrol you can give us, damn it <laughs> Free booze every day of the week All the things cool. Wages back what does that mean? Do you have wages? Like wages what that you were weren't paid? Were you enslaved at some point? I don't remember any talk about Aboriginals being actually enslaved in Australia. Maybe Australian people can Well, you know, they were sent to prison for crime, therefore that's slavery. So No, the Aboriginals weren't, though, were they? No, I mean, I mean these actually, kids you know, to be impressed. fair, these, these kids, yeah. What if they were murderers, though? It doesn't matter. They were peaceful petrol stealers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All the things that we imagine when we demand the Uluru Statement. So this is the kind of person that's backing it. This is the kind of person who seems to be behind the scenes talking with the Australian Prime Minister about this. So when people worry, and then the Australian government comes out and says that this is evil misinformation, then uh, it doesn't appear to be, as far as I'm concerned. Because guess what the Australian government is coming out and doing? saying that it's evil misinformation, and then do you know what else they might be doing? Sniffing petrol with their friends? They or? might just ban misinformation, oh. which, of course, they determine what misinformation is. Yeah. This is from I Say Toad, I assume, another proud Australian. Did they Australian. declare hate speech again? Uh, close enough. Yeah. He says, uh, Albanese government moves today, and that was, uh, when he says today, he means the 25th of June, yesterday as we're recording, uh, with draft legislation to shut down the no case, with polls now showing at best 50-50 for a yes outcome. Albo is going to gag Australians why even bother having a referendum. And this all checks out. Millions of dollars in fines to punish online misinformation under the new bill. So the Amer Australian Communications and Media Authority, ACMA, would be armed with the ability to require digital platforms to keep certain records about matters regarding misinformation and disinformation and turn them over when requested. So this will be something similar to the online harms bill, which might be pushed through Parliament in the UK as well, which will put all of online content produced in the UK or produced for the UK under the remit of Ofcom. The key points here are the, what's important. So the industry would be required to develop a pr code of practice with violations of the code, resulting in penalties of up to $2.75 million or 2% of their global turnover. Can you imagine how much that is for the larger media companies like Twitter and like Facebook? I mean, it's clearly just give me the money. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pointing the gun at your head and saying, give me the money. And what is the misinformation? According to the draft bill, misinformation is defined as unintentionally false, misleading or deceptive content. Also, defining misinformation... Anything that disagrees with the state. Okay. Yep. Disinformation as misinformation intentionally disseminated to cause serious harm. But the important thing I note here is unintentionally false. Unintentionally just means you were wrong about it. Oh yeah, hang on, what? Yeah, unintentionally <laughs> false. So it doesn't even mean that you are coming out in bad faith and purposefully trying I, to I mis put the, spread uh, misinformation. Decimal point in the wrong place. Prison. <laughs> yeah. Twitter, give me billions and billions of dollars, please. Absolutely ridiculous. And if this passes, we can guess exactly what sort of thing they're going to be calling as disinformation because we've got politicians, uh, well, Tony Calmer, 
who is a part of the Australian government on the yes side of the referendum to give the Australian indigenous peoples a voice, the aboriginals a voice, says that politicians on the other side and the opposition are deliberately peddling misinformation on the indigenous voice. So this will just come down to people saying, hold up, clearly this will snowball into something that is much worse and much bigger than what is being put forward right now. And then all of a sudden, if this bill gets put through as well, the Australian government gets to turn around and say, that's misinformation because it doesn't explicitly say that in the referendum. Then they the opposition turn around and say, you've not told us what this looks like on the other side. That's one of our big complaints. And then the Australian government goes, too bad, we've shut you down. Also, we're getting our billions of gibs off of Twitter. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the Symposium series, this episode on personal autonomy. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.